All right, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, this is uh, a SIGAuth deep dive. Uh, we're going to be covering the Kubernetes authentication and authorization subsystem. Um, I did. Okay. Uh, so who are we? Uh, my name is Matt Rogers. I'm a senior software engineer with Red Hat. Um, my co-presenter is Mo Khan. Uh, and a software engineer at Red Hat, and we both work on OpenShift on the auth team. Uh, Mo is also a SIG auth uh, co-chair. Okay, to start with an outline, uh, we are going to cover the request flow, uh, the request handler registration, uh, the, um, the request context, request metadata, all of the items in the request flow. Um, we're going to go over the authentication uh, piece. Uh, we're going to look at some of the, uh, the authenticator types. Um, we're also going to cover the authenticator uh, union semantics, how the authenticators uh, interact with each other. Um, and the same thing for the authorization uh, piece. So this diagram shows the flow that an incoming request goes through. Uh, the HTTP request starts off by being converted into request info metadata, uh, and it's passed to the authentication layer. Um, the authentication layer authenticates the request and passes it to the audit layer where there might be a log generated somewhere about the request. Um, after the audit layer comes the impersonation layer, this layer, we're not going to cover this in detail, but this layer checks if there was the desire to perform an action as uh, some user. If so, then there's a check to see if the requester has permission to act as the user. And assuming that that checks out, the request is modified so that the action is performed as the requested user. Um, so after impersonation is authorization. Uh, here the request is authorized. Um, and resource rest is where the request finally hits the rest API or the, the business logic at the end. Um, and if there's a failure at any of these layers, then the request flow stops. Um, so the authentication authorization framework is implemented as a series of HTTP server handlers. Um, so if you're familiar with Go, you've most likely come across this code or written some variant of it. Um, you define your handler function uh, that, might, um, that might do something with the request and write to the response. Uh, and then you register the, hand, the handler um, to handle under a, a specific path on the server. Uh, and then you, you start your server. So since the request has to go through multiple layers, as you saw from the earlier slide, uh, processing is implemented as a series of wrapped HTTP handlers. Uh, the registration function, uh, which uh, the signature here, you, takes an existing handler, um, and here's some configurable data item that defines the behavior of the handler, and then it wraps that existing handler and returns a new handler. Um, so this slide shows some example code to display the ordering of these wrapped handlers during registration. The handler that implements your business logic is wrapped, is wrapped first within authorization handler here, and then an authentication handler right there. Uh, so the last handler to be registered acts on the request first. So in this example, we have an authentication we have authentication that will act on the request first, and then the next in line would be uh, authorization. So it's, it's a basically a stack. The request comes up, up through that way. So these wrapped handlers are distinct, and they don't communicate with each other directly, only through the passed in request. Uh, so during the request flow, each layer communicates with the next by modifying the request context object. Uh, at each layer with context is called to include the data specific for that layer. Uh, the flow of information here is just one way down the chain. The lay they don't 
ever communicate back up to the previous layer. So as you saw in the previous slide, each layer adds on to the context uh, that moves through the request flow uh, using with value and with context functions together uh, adds data and replaces the current context uh, with the new one while keeping a shallow copy of the old request. So taking a look at the, the context interface, um, it has a value method that takes some key uh, and returns something. So empty interface is there. Uh, the with value function takes an existing context, a key, and a value, and returns a context. So here's the context implementation returned by with value. We're calling value follows the parent context in order to find the value under the key. This highlights something about the key that we use here. If the key is not guaranteed to be unique across all contexts, then you could potentially have a collision um, and return the wrong data. Uh, so as you, uh, and as you might have noticed that this context, I mean this chain is effectively a, a linked list. So we don't care about the key itself. We just want to make it unique across the entire program. So how we do that in Go uh, normally is def you define a private type alias to int. Uh, and making a constant of that alias is guaranteed to be unique as that's a private type for your package. Uh, so even if a type with the same name is declared in a different package, uh, they won't compare as equal. Um, as you saw before, there's a just a comparison there uh, to see if that um, that key is uh, is appropriate for uh, that particular context in the in the list. And here we use the with value function to store some data under the unique key. So we have the data type that's relevant for your handler and. Uh, and then it's added to the context with the with value call and under that unique key. And similarly, extracting the data um, in a handler involves using our unique key with the value method and casting it to our unique data type. So bringing this together, uh, the, you can see there's the example update of the request context and also later fetching the data. So this slide shows an expanded example of the context after moving through the request flow. Uh, as you can see, there are nested contexts with key value data ad added at each layer. Uh, at the deepest nesting, we have the request info uh, data, uh, which we'll look at, look at that a little closer. Um, after that is the user info uh, data here uh, that's added by the authentication layer. Um, and finally, at the, at the highest level of nesting, we have the audit data added by the audit layer. So this slide shows the request info from the first layer in more detail. Uh, this object contains metadata about the request uh, that'll be used by the rest of the stack. Uh, the request info is especially uh, important for the authorization layer. Um, it contains a minimal amount of request information that the author, that a later handler can base an access decision on, uh, and it could feasibly cache this as opposed to doing something like caching the, the entire HTTP request, which even though it might be a request for the same uh, path and everything, the body would be different and um, that wouldn't work for, for caching. Um, and you can't expect later handlers to always like reach out to, uh, to um, something or fetch any other data about the request. So it prepares this for the whole stack. Um, so if you look at the default build handler chain function in the API server package, yeah, there's a lot of, cold, a lot of code here, hold on. Uh, uh, you can see how the standard handler chain is set up. 
where the handlers are registered in an order where the last to be registered are the first to touch the request. So you can see the with request info down here and it goes up, authenticate the second step, authentication, audit, impersonation, and authorization. All right. So this slide shows the with authentication wrapper, which takes a handler and something that can authenticate a request. Um, if no authenticator here is passed in, it's a no op. It returns the current handler. Uh, otherwise, we're wrapping the input handler with, a hand, with another handler function that first tries to authenticate the request here. Uh, if there's an unsuccessful authentication, then the handler returns. Otherwise, the user is added to the existing context, and the request with the new context is passed on to the next handler in the chain. Uh, right there. Right. So here, we're starting to look at the authenticator interfaces. So this is the request interface. Uh, as you can see, it has an authenticate request method that takes an HTTP request, returns a response uh, object, um, a Boolean if you're authenticated or not, and an error for there being a hard failure. Now to give a, uh, a, an example of the behavior of the bool and the error return together, so if the authenticator, for example, compares a token in the request header against tokens in a backing store, and if there was no match, that's an, an unsuccessful authentication. Um, and in that case, the return would be false and nil error. But if the authenticator encountered like some kind of network error uh, or database error reading the backing store or something like that, um, then that would return false and actually return an error. So here's the response uh, struct. Uh, the response contains some user info about the authenticated user to be used by the later layers, and plus a list of audiences for who the authenticated token uh, might be intended for. So here's the user interface, user info interface, which describes a user that has been authenticated to the system contains methods for fetching the authenticated output. Um, so get name returns the name that uniquely identifies the user. Uh, get UID returns um, a unique value for a particular user that will change if the user is removed from the system and another user is added with the same name. There's also the groups that the user is a member of um, and an extra map that contains information uh, that the authenticator thought was interesting. And one example of that is uh, scopes on a token. Now, a note about the name versus the UID. Uh, so cube is generally name-based in, in this area. So the use of the UID is not particularly common. Uh, using the UID depends on a later handler's uh, behavior. So some may handle that and, and not. Um, I use my notes. Uh, okay. uh, so, like with all, with the RBAC uh, authorizer, uh, does not use the UID. That'll use get name. So that's kind of the canonical authorizer here with the RBAC. Um, so here's the X509 request authenticator. Uh, here, uh, the certificate is verified using a CA that the authenticator is configured with. And then the user information is extracted from the certificate subject and returned. So if you look at the verify options uh, struct in the corner, uh, this is configuration for the, verifi for the verifier, where you can configure the CA pool and any acceptable key usage for the certificate. Um, so for that authenticator, this is the default user conversion function that extracts the user from a certificate chain at the LEAF uh, certificate. Um, and 
And uh, here is a, an example of the uh, certificate conversion. Um, so in this case, the subject, uh, the certificate subject of OU of foo and CN of bar uh, gets, um, the user info that gets extracted is the name bar and groups foo. So there's also a, a header authenticator um, that gathers the uh, user information from specific request headers and that's all it does. And use the loan, it's completely insecure. Configuring this, name headers, group headers, it could be, an, it could be like uh, cube underscore whatever. Uh, whatever you define here, it'll just grab that information from the header um, and stick it into the user info. So this is the other variant of the X509 request authenticator. Uh, so this one, instead of just verifying and just returning the user conversion re results, it verifies the certificate and then checks the common name against a configured set of allowed common names. So if the name checks out, then it continues on to call the wrapped request header authenticator that we showed in the previous slide. Since this authenticator provides the right certificate authentication and then calls the uh, header authenticate authenticator right afterwards, uh, then it makes the use of the header authenticator secure. All right, moving on. Now we'll cover the token interface. The authenticate token method takes a context and a token and returns response, uh, bool, or error. The same semantics from the, uh, the other uh, authenticator interface. Um, so this is an example of some of the, of kind of a glue code between uh, between two authenticators. Uh, so the bear token authentic the uh, the bear token authenticator here um, starts out as a request header authenticator, and but you can just see that 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 extracts the bear token from the authorization header, and then passes that to the actual token authenticator. Um, here's the OIDC authenticator. Um, it's a common one to configure since you might use it with many other providers such as Google and GitLab. Some of the configuration for OIDC includes the server audiences which will be compared against audiences in the request if configured, an issuer URL to verify against the issuer claim in the token, and if these preliminary checks succeed, we verify and then start to extract claims uh, from the token. The claim names are also configure, configurable, so you can think of that, uh, that part of it as similar to the simple header authenticator that we showed earlier. And this slide shows the JOT authenticator, which is used to authenticate service account tokens. Uh, the token is parsed. Uh, claims are Claims and audiences are processed, and then the token is validated and the user info is returned. So we've talked about different kinds of token authenticators already, so if you think about what authenticating a token might entail, uh, it could involve some expensive lookup, uh, remote lookup, or an encryption operation. In this case, being able to wrap the token auth with a customizable caching authenticator allows for like a short-lived token cache uh, for optimization. So here's the union authenticator handler. So this authenticator is configured with a slice of authenticators and a fail on error option. So all authenticators are tried and a successful authentication from any of them returns uh, an okay response. Um, if fail on error is set to false, then a fatal error from one authenticator can be overrided by a successful return from a later authenticator. So if fail on error is true, then an error from any authenticator in the slice uh, short circuits the rest of the authenticators and returns the error. Um, so this is the authenticate request version of the union, and there's also an authenticate token variant. The, the 
parts that are highlighted in blue is literally the only thing that changes in the code between request and token union. All right, and I'm going to pass it off to Mo to wrap it up with the full example. Okay, so here we have like a visual representation of what we sort of talked so far, so I'll walk you guys through it. So uh, I'll walk from the outside, or the inside out first. So pretend you have a service account token authenticator here, right? And we also want to honor OIDC tokens. So we're gonna union those two things together, right? So now we have a singular token authenticator. And these two things can be expensive, right? You may have uh, some lookups you do in verification. So we go ahead and wrap it with a cache. And at that point, you still can't honor requests because this is a token authenticator and not a request authenticator. So we need to wrap it with a glue code that gives us a request authenticator. And perhaps you also want to honor uh, X509 certs, as was covered earlier. Uh, and we kind of look at the order of these things. X509, X509 is a super cheap check. You're just looking at metadata on the request. So we put that one first. And similarly, service accounts are super common, right? They're part of the core infrastructure, whereas YDC is users interacting with the system, generally speaking, right? So we put that one first because we want it to be tried first, right? And all of this gets union together. So like, let's walk a request coming in, right? So someone tries to authenticate, and this is a request that does not have a client cert on it, it just has a bearer token on it. So it's gonna go through here, it's gonna hit the X509 cert authenticator, which will say, there's nothing here for me. So we will keep going down. And we'll, let's pretend that these unions are both, uh, don't fail on any errors. They're just gonna pass things through. The bearer token authenticator will strip out the bearer token for us, pass it down. The cache is empty. We'll keep passing it down. We'll hit the union. Um, it'll hit the service account token authenticator. Let's say this was a user. The service account token error, uh, authenticator will error or otherwise say that this is not properly signed for me. It'll let it go down to OIDC. Right, let's pretend that it gets verified correctly. And as it comes back around, the cache will report it and you're authenticated. So let's say a few seconds later, you hit, you do another request, you know, you kubectl get some more pods, comes back in, goes to the cache, the cache is warm, it knows you're, who you are, it returns. So you short circuit early. So as a actual example from the code base for how we wire these things up together, so this is the delegating auth code, so things like the kubelet and such rely on this. Any sort of external component that wants to delegate its auth to the kube API server can use this type of code, so an aggregated API server might use this. Um, so we have the request header authenticator first, uh, client cert, um, token uh, auth. All of this is getting union together at the end. Uh, so all the token auth bits were union together with the cache, as I saw showed earlier, they get turned into a request authenticator, and then all of those authenticators get union together. Um, if you're authenticated, you need to have the system pull an authenticated group added to you automatically, so we have just a little wrapper that does that, and then that final authenticator is what's used. So if you remember back earlier, the with authentication bit takes a single authenticator, but it doesn't actually have to be a single one, it's just the end phase. So with authorization is very similar to with authentication. It has that no op bit at the top. Technically, you could have no authorizer. I don't recommend it. Um, but let's walk through this. So it's going to get some kind of authorization attributes from the context. We'll see in the next slide what that looks like. Then the authorizer is going to attempt an authorization decision based on those attributes. And here we see sort of the most distinct difference between authentication and authorization. Um, instead of having a Boolean state, we actually have a tri-state of allow, deny, and no opinion. This allows an authorizer to say that I explicitly know that this is a deny. You don't get to keep going further. So the unions on this don't have a concept of a fail on error or not. It's a, did, did they get denied or explicitly denied? So let's look through the interface, right? So the authorizer takes some attributes and gives us a decision, a reason for that decision, all right, so the decision is pretty straightforward, right? Did you explicitly deny this? Stop processing the request. Did you explicitly allow it? Also stop processing the request. Or is this a no opinion? I don't know, so maybe somebody else does. Let them have a shot at it. Uh, the attributes interface is just a combination of request info and user info and a simple method that just checks if it's sort of read-only actions against the API. Uh, so I didn't expand this out because you've already seen these two 
So let's talk about a really, really simple authorizer. So all this authorizer does is it looks at the user on the request, checks their groups, and sees if that group intersects with a configured set of groups. And if it does, it says it's an allow. Right? So we generally refer this, to this as the system Home master's magic authorizer. It's effectively a way of saying that if you are a user with this group, you can do anything because you always get an explicit allow. Otherwise, you just say, I don't know anything about this, keep going. A more complex authorizer, so this is the webhook authorizer, right? So this is a delegating authorizer in the sense that it delegates to the Kube API server to do some authorization decision. So it would be an external component asking the Kube API server to do some auth. Uh, so we have an API called Subject Access Review that helps us sort of do this. But if we walk through this, there's a conversion from these attributes into Subject Access Review. It's really straightforward because Subject Access Review is basically can some user perform some action, which is exactly what attributes has within it as uh, a user object in the question book. Right. So a tiny little bit of detail in there. Right? So there's some user groups and all these other things over here as well, as well as what, what are they trying to do? They're trying to create a pod in the empty string group, at the old core group. Right. That is the question you're going to ask the remote authorizer. So the way you do this is you, you build up that subject access review, and then you create it, which is the remote call against the Kube API server. And based on that result, you allow it in that. Right? So you've asked the Kube API server, can this person So RBAC is like the canonical example of an authorizer, but it will never fit on the slide. Um, and Jordan has uh, done it far more justice than I ever will be able to. So please go watch that talk. Uh, so let's try to put some authorizers together. So this is the union for authorizers. So as you can see, uh, we're going to try all of the ones that we're configured to um, try. But when we get down here, uh, we only short circuit if there's an explicit allow or an explicit deny. If it's a no opinion, we keep going. Right? So this is the sort of distinct difference that we have here. So let's look at the delegating authorizer bits. So as we covered, we have the magic authorizer at the top. We have some hats that we don't authorize for. So for example, like your slash helps endpoint, you don't necessarily need any auths for that. It's unprivileged um, information. And here we have that subject access review based delegating authorizer. We just union those things together, and we have one authorizer that the with authorization code is going to use, even though it's logical. So let's talk about authentication and authorization together as a bit of a piece, right? So we covered in the user inter uh, info interface this extra bit, right? So we can sort of think about this in certain situations as a contract between authentication and authorization. It doesn't have to be that, but let's consider a specific example, right? We, in OpenShift, we use this as a way of having scopes on tokens. You can also see like th this little bit right here, the key, it's just a string, so you do need to kind of namespace it so that other things don't get confused when they see this. So what does this look like in OpenShift, right? So we use this specific key as a way of carrying some values of scope. The exact semantics of the values don't matter too much here. Just, uh, I'll walk you guys through the authorizer. You can kind of see what it does with these things. So this little bit of OpenShift code is the scope authorizer. So the takeaway I want you guys to get from this is that this is an actual explicit deny authorizer. It never returns an allow. It only ever denies or returns no opinion. Right? So it checks their user extra and sees if there's some scopes on this request. If there's not, it doesn't have anything to do with leaves it alone. Otherwise, it's going to take the scopes that were passed in, and it's going to convert it into a set of RBAC rules. So we didn't cover RBAC, but the general gist is uh, very similar to like the subject access group bits you were saying, right? There's some verbs, some resources, right? So can you get pod or so forth, right? So your scope gets converted into a set of rules, and if those rules cover the action you're trying to actually do, then it's no opinion. It's not allowed. It's no opinion. So it's basically saying your scopes did not deny this request. Otherwise, if they don't cover it, this is an explicit deny. You don't get to go forward. So has anyone here used OpenShift 4? Anyone run the install, done any demos? Well, obviously, you guys have. You work on OpenShift. <laughs> um, 
So if you if you guys have used it, there's this user that you can log in as initially in the web console called kubectl admin. So when I initially wrote the code for this, I made a mistake, which is on the slide. So let's kind of walk through this, right? This user has authenticated to the system. It's given the system colon master screw, right? This is a bootstrap user, it can do anything, it's how you manage the cluster through the console in the beginning. So it kind of makes sense. And let's say it went through a flow that gave it the scope, right? So if you have ever used OpenShift and logged into Jenkins via OAuth, Prometheus, Grafana, that's what scope that subcomponent gets. So like Grafana gets a token for you that has a scope on it. It's perfectly safe because this token can't do anything other than check your info, right? And as a very trimmed down example of how authorizers look in OpenShift, Let's pretend you have the magic authorizer, the scope authorizer, and the RBAC authorizer. So can anybody tell me why this cannot work? Any guesses? Go for it. Does it have to do with the system master's authorizer running first? Yes, correct. Which means our talk was so much successful. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. So basically, the mistake I made when I wrote this uh, was I was thinking in my mind, well, this user can do anything. So I should give them this group. I don't have to check anything else, uh, except what happened is when they would get a scope token, scopes would never get a chance to deny. It would always just get approved, and that's not what you want. That's the, the kind of defeats the point of scopes. So certainly you could try to reorder the authorizers, but you really want this one first because it's super cheap, and a lot of things use it, and we don't want all the loopback connections to start having random authorizers you need to go through. So. What I ended up doing is I, I, I changed this out to a uh, system polling cluster admins, which is a normal group that's just assigned via RBAC, the cluster admin cluster role. So this gets skipped, scopes denies, as you expect, or goes through an RBAC allows or denies, or doesn't say. And thanks for coming, guys. What time is it? We did 32. Oh, cool. We have time. Awesome. I went fast. Do we have questions? Go for it, David. Uh, so one thing that's kind of annoying is that I can't have groups for my service accounts, right? So there's an implicit group for the namespace. There's a group for all service accounts. But there's no, uh, I want this one to be in group three. Are you guys going to try to address that? So I'm pretty sure Clayton's going to make me address it at some point. Uh, to, to be, let's be very fair. Uh, but yeah, I have, I have thought about it. Um, certainly, you know, I was tempted at some point to hack it. I decided that was a poor choice of my time. Um, but yeah, I, I've thought about what that would kind of look like. I assume the group would exist in the namespace since the service account has to live in the namespace. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 I do think that we want a more robust way of categorizing But yes, don't be shy. Do you have any plans uh, to extend RBAC uh, to be able to do more like label-based um, authorization of resources? So like, uh, it's a, this is a very common feature request, but so like if we go back and look at our interface of what we have, uh, I want to go back to authentication. There is. I guess I. I guess I really want to custom code. But I'll get there eventually. Almost there. Is this your custom code? Right. You don't have access to it. There, you have no access to the body whatsoever. So authorizers cannot make a decision about the shape of an object. Admission is the sole sort of curator of that there. Also, we, uh, we want authorization to be extremely fast and easy to cache, and having decisions that are based on the body of objects gets really mucky. We did have some of this stuff initially in OpenShift before like, we ported this stuff over to RBAC, and it was pretty complex. Like, we had a caching authorizer, but it would check to make sure that you couldn't cache the request, or could or could not. Yeah, I, I'm aware it's kind of messy. Um, some like Opa and stuff has like much more robust 
ability to do this because we have policies that apply to the mission, but you, some people want to have things at the um, read layer, and that gets messy too because the mission doesn't run on read. It's not solved yet, so, but I know where it's from. So one other thing I've been looking for, so um, one particular problem uh, I've solved actually by implementing some of these interfaces is authentication with Firebase. It's kind of a weird use case there. Um, I wasn't able to use OIDC, even though it's an OIDC to uh, token, because they don't have the discovery URLs. Um, is initially I was looking to find webhook implementations or like scaffolding, but really couldn't find it other than inside a existing API server. Is there a plan with the SIG to maybe provide a framework or add something in like Key Builder or some of the other associated ecosystem projects? So, so you couldn't use OIDC because they don't provide you with the public keys? They don't provide, it's not uh, OIDC compliant with the discovery URL. So it doesn't have like the well-known URL? Yeah, it doesn't have any of that. Can you just host one? With the, the But it's a public, like you should have, you have the public keys somewhere, right? Like somebody has to have the, the public keys. The public keys are there, yes. Right, so you're, you're not minting the token yourself, right? You just no. want to authenticate them. So, uh, I mean, so there are plans in general, like uh, if you've been following the new token request API for service accounts, like we want those identities to be able to be asserted outside of the cluster, like inside of like your cloud provider. Right? So there are plans on making it so that the Cube API server itself uh, exerts metadata about its tokens. But on to your specific question though, like it's very like, I would expect there, like you should be able to technically post a well-known URL to pass to our OIDC authenticator so that it can do the verification because um, as long as the issuer URL is correct and all the public key bit is correct, it should be able to authenticate it. Um, otherwise, I'm trying to think about how far we've gotten in decoupling all of this stuff that it can never be moved out of the core. Um, so I'm trying to think, like, the delegated auth code is, I think, relatively separate now, but I don't know if it's like super easy to consume. Like, uh, like I, don't, I, I, I certainly I would not be against any effort to make it easier to consume. The, the problem hasn't been consuming; it's hosting. Oh, like where, like, like yeah, self-hosting so on the cluster. Yeah, if I want to host a token access review and a subject. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the general desire for that stuff has always been that like you know like GitHub will have a little integration, GitLab will have a little integration, like sort of custom because yeah. they're all like not all of them are going to be OIDC, right? Like GitHub is an OIDC, they're some of them. I don't I don't know if their tokens have any structure. I don't remember. Um, so I would I would think it would be sort of a per provider thing, but it it should all just be a pretty small. Shouldn't have like some access to that you, yeah. unless you're are you delegating authorization to that code to somehow? It's possible. I just mentioned it bigger than token access for the ASM. I guess the most pressing issue. Right. Matt, what, what time is it? Are we done? Are we, yeah. okay. are we way past? Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for the questions. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll be around. You guys have